Hello guys, welcome to Redditor's Revenge. Here we post amazing revenge stories daily. And if you want more content like this please do subscribe to the channel and stay tuned with us. Moving to our today's first story, about how OP exposes the shady car dealership who tried to scam him. So OP destroyed the whole company and took everything they had. Now story. Switching jobs was hard enough without dealing with all the problems that came along with it. My name is Larry, I'm a 30-year-old single man, I have a degree in software engineering and recently moved across the country. Why? Because I just landed the job of my dreams. It was almost double the pay of my previous job and I get free health and dental insurance with paid time off. Sounds like a pretty sweet deal, right? That's what I had thought. It had all been going great. I had nearly depleted my savings while moving but I didn't mind. The new job meant that I would soon recover my losses and even have a nice amount in my savings account by the time I turned 35. The only problem was that I hadn't been able to find suitable accommodation anywhere near my place of work. I had found an apartment in the suburbs at a good deal of distance away from my company. This presented me with a problem. I would either have to take public transport twice a day for a minimum amount of an hour each time, or I could buy a car. I had never been a fan of public transport and spending two hours each day on a bus or train didn't sound very appealing to me. Due to this reason, I started doing my research on the latest or used models of cars that were in my price range. My job didn't start a week after I arrived, so I had plenty of time to think about my options. I gradually settled on a mid-range, decent car with plenty of nice features that were within my price range. Soon after, I started calling local dealers to inquire about whether the model I was looking for was available or not. Most of the car dealers flat out told me that they were all sold out, since it was one of the most popular models of the year, due to its price and snazzy features. The few dealers that still had the cars available, or were waiting for shipments, politely refused and told me that there were already long lines of people waiting for the car. With such a long waitlist, no dealer could procure a car for me on such short notice. I tried looking at a few other cars that I had kept as my backup options. I didn't like any of them and was forced to admit that if I gave in and bought any of them, I would be wasting my money and would regret not buying the car I had originally wanted. The only option I had left was to take public transport for a while and then figure out what to do next. I was pretty disappointed as I had my heart set on the car. For a single, unattached bachelor in my position, there are very few hobbies in life. Working towards a dream car was one of them. Eh, what could I do? I had to deal with it and resolve to enter my new job with a positive mindset. A couple of weeks went by and I adjusted to my new job quite well. After so much time, even public transport was growing on me. I had to get up super early to beat the rush and travel when there weren't many passengers but I made the best of the situation. I completely put the car matter out of my mind. That all changed when I entered my second month in the new city. Out of the blue, one day on the weekend, while I was relaxing in my lounge watching TV, I got a call. It was one of the dealers I had spoken to before about getting a car. He sounded extremely excited while talking to me. He told me that he had just gotten a batch of cars delivered and there were a few of the cars that I had wanted. He told me in great detail about the price and features of the car and told me that I just had to come and visit him. He told me that he would get me a good deal, but to hurry up since his dealership was very popular, and I ran the risk of the car being sold out before I got there. I was overjoyed to hear this. I promised to visit him next Monday and set up an appointment. Next, I called my boss and requested a day off of work. I explained the situation to him in detail. Being a fellow car enthusiast, he had no problem with that and told me to take all the time I needed. Everything was finally falling into place. I couldn't believe my good fortune. On Monday, I reached the car dealership at exactly 9 a.m. and was one of the first customers inside. The staff was extremely friendly, and I told them that I had an appointment with Mr. Rogers. The guy I had talked to on the phone with, I noticed something odd but didn't think much of it at the time. The staff was overly friendly, inquiring about me and my life, about work, where I lived, etc. They offered me a ton of refreshments and seated me in a nice lounge with an excellent view of the city. Oh well, I thought, maybe the staff at car dealerships were required to be this friendly, to quickly close deals. Not even 10 minutes later, Mr. Rogers came out to greet me. He was a middle-aged man of average height and build, with balding hair and very sharp, blue eyes. 
He greeted me enthusiastically and told me that I had done well coming this quickly. He kept up a stream of friendly chatter to the car. It was even better than I expected. I had wanted a cobalt blue color, and it looked even better in person. It was shiny and amazing and just what I had wanted. I ran my hands over every inch of the car, delighted. Mr. Rogers explained all of the features in great detail and waxed poetic about the upgrade from last year's model and all the extra features that had been added to this model. He showed me the latest engine that was installed, the comfortable, well-proportioned seats, the extremely adequate leg room, and several features that I didn't even know about. He seemed eager to close the deal and tried to steer me towards payment and all those things a few times. I was equally as eager and decided that this was just the car for me. I asked Mr. Rogers if I could take the car for a spin around the block and he agreed. He handed over the keys with a friendly smile and asked if he should get the paperwork ready for signing. I told him that that would be great and we'll talk about that as soon as I got back. I drove the car around the block. It was indeed a very smooth ride and a beautiful machine. I was extremely satisfied with it. When I got back, Mr. Rogers herded me into his office and presented a set of papers that needed signing. I looked through everything carefully and then signed the paperwork. Mr. Rogers jumped up excitedly and shook my hand. He told me that I could pick up the car sometime next week and that he would handle all the other matters. I transferred the first part of the money over and then asked him if I could have another look at the car. The final payment would be next week when I picked up the car. He said sure and I went off to examine the car another time. Opening the driver's door, I ran my hand over the steering wheel and marveled once again over how soft the leather was. Looking down, I suddenly noticed the chassis number printed on the car. I can't say what exactly made me take a picture of it, but I did. I was thinking that I'd take a cool shot and then post it on Instagram or another social media app when I got home. Whatever it was, I took a picture of the number and then closed the door. I bid goodbye to Mr. Rogers and then took off for home. Luckily, I already owned a garage apartment. I had been using the garage space for storage and spent the next weekend moving everything out to make space for my new car. Next Monday, I enlisted the help of my friend, Aaron, who worked at the company with me, to come with me and pick the car up. Off we went, the two of us, and soon reached the dealership. To my disappointment, there was none of the usual fanfare this time. The staff treated us politely, but not over-enthusiastically as they had done last time. We were quickly escorted into a small, dimly lit room and told to wait. No refreshments, no pleasantries, nothing. After over an hour later, we were told Mr. Rogers was free to see us. I was pretty annoyed by this time but tried to control myself. I would have a brand new car soon, I told myself. Mr. Rogers greeted me in his usual style, but even he was a little more subdued today. He asked for the final payment, which I transferred over. I signed all the relevant papers. He then handed over the documents to me. I flipped through the documents. Everything seemed to be in perfect order until I suddenly noticed the chassis number of the model. I was pretty sure it was different than the one I had been shown the other day. I took out my phone and, in a low voice, asked Aaron to read it for me. Lo and behold, the number was entirely different. I got up and asked Mr. Rogers to show me my new car. He ordered his assistant to take me. The car that he led me to looked entirely similar to the car that I had seen before. I went back and forth, examining every tiny little detail. Sure enough, the leather of the steering wheel looked different and there was a tiny, almost imperceptible scuff mark on the rear bumper. Finally, I walked around to the driver's seat and inspected the chassis number on the door. My fears were confirmed. This was an entirely different car from the one before. Angrily, I asked the staff member to get me, Mr. Rogers. The staff assistant hurried back and forth and then informed me that Mr. Rogers had left for the day. He wouldn't be available till the next day. I didn't know what to do. Aaron advised me to threaten them and say that I was going to call the police if Mr. Rogers didn't come out and deal with everything. I said that it was a good idea and that we should try it. I started making a fuss, loudly shouting that the company had scammed me and was being unfair to me and that the police should deal with such a matter. At that, one of the staff members hurried to the back of the store, and soon after, Mr. Rogers came out, pretending as if he had just come back to the store. He rudely asked us what had happened, and I told him that he had switched the cars and was tricking me into buying another car, not the one he had originally promised. He became enraged, saying that he had done a good deed and helped me out in a tough spot, and that we were slandering him and his work and trying to defame the company. 
Hearing this, I knew that he had no intention of owning up. I took out my phone and called the police. Mr. Rogers told me that he was in the right and that I couldn't prove he had done anything wrong. He accused me of trying to get a better deal on the car. The police soon showed up and I explained the entire situation to them. They told me that this was a sensitive matter and that they would investigate my claims fully. They confiscated the car and told me to go home. Somebody from their department would call me later, they said, and advised me to get a lawyer. I asked Aaron if he knew any lawyers and he gave me his friend's number, saying that he specialized in cases such as this. Later that day, I went online and looked up the National Car Registry. I put in the chassis number of the car that Mr. Rogers had tried to sell me. The registry clearly showed that it was a used car. I was convinced now that I had been scammed. I talked to the lawyer that Aaron had mentioned. He told me to sue the company for fraud and in the meantime, gather as much evidence as I can about the cars being switched. I remembered that I had some emails from Mr. Rogers saved on my phone that clearly said that the car was a brand new model. I sent those over to my lawyer and filed a lawsuit. Another thing that I was convinced about that the company's stellar reputation notwithstanding. There must have been other people that Mr. Rogers had scammed out of their money and sold a fake car to, or at least similar cases in the area of the country that I could find. If I could provide witnesses in court that Mr. Rogers wasn't the saintly businessman he claimed to be, then I would win the lawsuit in a heartbeat. I posted my story on several forums, including Twitter and Reddit. I also started frequenting sites where users talked about car dealerships and the sale of used or secondhand cars. After a few days of silence and anonymous users sympathizing with me, a user reached out. He said that he had gone to the same car dealership a few months back and had been scammed out of a new car, just like I had. After discovering the truth, he had tried talking to Mr. Rogers, who had threatened him and his family with bodily harm. The user also said that he was from a poor family and he had spent all of his savings on the car and had none left over for a lawyer. With a heavy heart, he had decided not to sue and accept his fate. I told him that I was ready to help him out too. All he had to do was show up and testify in court about his harrowing ordeal. It would strengthen my case and allow him the opportunity to get justice as well. A day later, another stranger approached me online and told me the same story as mine and the guy from before. He said that similar circumstances, lack of money, and threats forced him not to file a lawsuit and go to court. I directed both of these strangers to my lawyer and told them that we would do our best to help them. I then talked to my lawyer in detail and we came up with a strategy to provide a strong defense in court. Two days before the hearing, I got a call from Mr. Rogers. I had a brilliant idea. I thought he might say something incriminating in the phone call so I recorded the whole thing. He threatened me, saying that I would be sorry for going up against him and that he would ring me for every last penny that I had. When I refused to answer him, he said he knew where I lived and that I should think about what he could do to me if I didn't back down. I was relieved that I had recorded the phone call. I made a copy of the recording and sent it to my lawyer to submit in court. The hearing was a long and tedious process complicated by the fact that the car dealership had excellent reviews and nobody had had a problem with them before. Mr. Rogers had bribed or blackmailed people to have a clean record. I wouldn't back down, however, and my side submitted the photos with the changed chassis number, the emails, and the incriminating phone call in court. Upon hearing the phone call recording, Mr. Rogers went pale. Tom, he hadn't expected me to make such a move. When our side presented the other two witnesses with details of transactions and accounts of what they had gone through, Mr. Rogers nearly fainted with shock. Haha, that's what you get when you're a lying, cheating idiot. In the end, the court ruled in my favor, saying that the company had been in the wrong and attempted to defraud me. He ordered them to return all the money that I had paid and pay me extra in damages caused. They also ordered an investigation launched into the company and against Mr. Rogers. I found out later that the dealership had to close down and that Mr. Rogers lost his company. My lawyer also told me that Mr. Rogers had filed for bankruptcy and that soon, his wife divorced him, taking the kids away from him and moving across the country. I was ecstatic to hear this news. What with my money being returned to me and the extra money that I had gotten in the lawsuit, I could afford an even better car than the one I had been looking for. One thing was for sure, things were looking up and I wouldn't have to take public transport to work ever again. Now, here is the end of the story. I hope you enjoyed it, and let me know your opinion about this story in the comments section. 
and you can also share your experience with shady people. So before leaving please hit the like button and do subscribe to the channel to stay tuned with us for more awesome stories.